Good afternoon, friends. We are finally back from Thanksgiving break. And we need to finish up this Kingdom Hearts eventually. So, that's what we're going to do today. Or at least try to. So, just a brief reminder of what we were doing before. We attempted this once before and it did not come out the way we wanted. Everything was just a little too bright and poppy. And we wanted the focus to be on Sora here. So with this attempt, we're going to be attempting to make the colors a little more muted. Which means for anything that's outside of Sora, going to be the base color mixed with some variation of white or gray in order to bring down the saturation enough. Everything else pops in relation to it. That's what we're going to do. Got myself some goblin green on the palette here. Um, dead white, some stonewall gray. We're just gonna mix this up a bit to see if we can get a nice desaturated green we like. And today felt like a K-pop day because it's been a long while since I've played any K-pop, just in general. That's looking pretty desaturated, but still a nice green. Let's get some water in there, thin it out a bit. And see how this applies to our scrap wood. Not bad. It might need a little bit more green in there. Just like a little dab more. Because we still want to be recognizably green on the wood. And we also are going to want enough so that we can do not only the trees in the background of the central pane, but the weird little frond looking bits on the ring. We might just preemptively grab a whole bunch of this. But we can mix in a little bit more of the grand white too. Looks pretty good. Uh, and I think I'm gonna grab some of my medium. Here we are. Got a big dropper of glaze medium here. Gonna give that a quick shake on the vortex. Hopefully my microphone is working right now. Really hate for that uh, to happen again. Just gonna double that, check that real quick. Yep, yeah, it's working. What this is gonna do is it's gonna thicken our paint up a bit while still giving it good flow, making it a little bit more transparent, extending it a bit. just overall gives it a little bit more utility. See there. It's the color enough that we can work with it pretty well on the wood, but not so much that it's running all over the place. So we're just going to get right into it. 
start at these trees. I think I'm going to need a little bit of water just to get flow off the brush better. Always a balancing act between having enough water to make it flow. Not so much that it floods. So how's everybody else doing out there today? Y'all having a good Monday? Or at least as good of a Monday as you can have? Personally, I'm looking forward to this Friday. I only get to roll off of my current project at work, which means I get to do something fresh and new next time. Whenever I get put on a new project. Hopefully I'll get to take a little bit of a break before then, but we'll see. Never been really allowed to take much of a, a bench break. Oh, hey, Kild. It's been a while since I've seen you around. How are you doing, bud? Hopefully I can be some nice background noise for you. Aside from the funkiness that was Desert Bus and the holidays, try to keep a pretty consistent schedule. So I'm wondering about my Saturday stream. I think that's too early for most people. Might shift that up another hour. There we go. I think that's looking pretty good. The color isn't too overwhelming. Wood grain still shows through a little bit, but still a nice green. I really do like this glazing medium. It has some additive to it 
that uh, really helps the self-leveling. Imagine it's some sort of surfactant, sort of like the flow improver. I'm not entirely sure. Yeah, your life's a bit crazy right now, Kel. That's, uh, I feel like that's a bit understandable. Group's pretty fun. Stray Kids. They um, they were actually my first K-pop concert. Saw them in Chicago earlier this year, and boy, do those uh, guys have some energy. Never been to a concert where one group played for the entire four hours before. It was something else. Just gonna dab off some of this because I think I loaded the surface a little too much. And even it out real quick. There we go, that's better. Don't want it soaking to the grain too much. Well, they did uh, do like costume changes and stuff. The benefit to having, um, God, how many members do they have again? 10, 12, something like that. They're one of those really big K-pop groups. Um, so they can subdivide into smaller groups when they want to do more intimate songs you know with just like three or four of them on stage which gives the other time other uh, so many time to go and change costume get ready for their songs take a water break or something so it's not like all of the members were upstage all the time and of course they talk uh like um talking breaks you know chat with the audience real quick have a little discussion about, you know, the songs and the work they've been doing lately. Hey, Rubik. But yeah, it was definitely a good time. Would highly recommend uh, anybody who is into K-pop to try going out to at least uh, one concert in their lifetime.
right, just gonna double check my reference image, make sure I've got all of the green for the trees done. And we're gonna move ourselves on to the rings. Yeah, I feel that. I need to be going to more concerts in general. Had so many on the docket. And then, you know, as is typical, COVID hit. So most of the concerts I've been to have been the same uh, few punk and ska bands when they've come into town. Seen Streetlight Manifesto, Real Big Fish, The Interrupters, Flogging Molly. All amazing shows, of course. It's just... I want to see a bit more. Hey, Finn. I can't complain. It's a Monday, but uh, I've got my paints. Yeah, real big fish. Uh, honestly, I'd say any ska or punk band really knows how to put on a good show. It's just like built into their DNA. I was a much younger lad when I saw them in Street Light in concert. So by the end of the night, I was dripping with sweat and feeling great. Don't think I could uh, survive that concert now. <laughs> oh man, industrial. I wouldn't give to have the ability to go back in time and uh, experience an old school industrial act like uh, Depeche Mode or something when they were in their prime. What a trip that'd be. <laughs> yeah, when... Uh, an angle grinder or a sledgehammer is an instrument. You know, you're having a good time. Saw a video of Depeche Mode once where some of the instruments they had on stage were you know, a sledgehammer with a cinder block or uh, a length of industrial grade chain that they were just slapping across the floor. Talk about experimental. Annoyingly, despite the fact that I'm using a wet palette, this uh, this green is starting to form a film. I'm not happy about it. Wet palette usually makes it take much longer to dry. That said, I am kind of starting from a drier base, so might be half the issue. So hopefully we can get through this section without losing all of our paint, but we'll see. 
Definitely don't want to try remixing the color as it is. I think I've said it before that I'm personally a big fan of buying the paint exactly the color I want it to be. Um, so that I don't have to mix paints. Because far too often I mix just slightly too little paint. And, um, you know, you have to remix right at the end, and it never comes out exactly the same color. So then you, as a creator, notice that your uh, one section is just one shade too light or too dark compared to the rest, and you'll never be happy with it, so you have to repaint over it. So yeah, hopefully I don't have to remix here, but we'll see. Hey, Coyote. How are you doing today? I think after we're done working on these fronds, go into the crowns. You know, every day before I stream, I always say to myself, you know, this time I think I'm going to be quieter. I'm just going to paint and relax my throat. Just to let people enjoy the process. And then as soon as that stream uh, goes live, I'm like, okay, now we're going to just talk through every aspect of everything that's going in through my head right now. That's fine. I've got uh, I've got my Nalgene full of water next to me. And it's good to get the vocal muscles a workout. This group is definitely one of my guilty pleasures. The, uh, the Toy Scrolls there. Because, you know, they've got that reputation of being that ultra-manufactured 
even among um, K-pop groups. Being a super girly bubblegum pop designed to really get men going. The problem is it just works. <laughs> it's really good uh, earworm electro pop. And you just need something happy and bubbly. And of course, all the girls are super cute. What can I say? I'm not made out of stone. You know, if I had been smart, I could have probably just pulled up the uh, Kingdom Hearts soundtrack. Played that over the back of the stream. Get you some of that simple and clean going on there. And maybe next time. Bad news for me, I think I'm running out of paint. Gonna have to mix some more up. Well, hopefully we can get this looking exactly the same, but might have to accept the fact that these greens are going to be slightly off. That's definitely too white. A little bit more green. Might just be something where I end up going back over everything a little bit to try and blend the colors more. Annoying as that is. Let's see if we can't fix this.
that might be close enough. Oh yeah, definitely, uh, definitely realize that after a few of these, that it's much better to have a test palette instead of running with it on the main piece. It's all about trial and error. We get the glaze medium on there again. Thin that out a bit. And that's one thing that um, you'll hear this a little bit from uh, people doing tutorials and stuff. Is never to compare your work to anybody on like Instagram or anything. There we go. I think that matches up pretty well. Uh, never compare yourself to anybody on Instagram or Twitter or anything like that because you never know how long they took to figure out the little tricks that they know to make the millions of errors that you're going to make how many hours they put into a piece of work whether or not they actually use you know tracing or references or anything like that there's just so much that goes on behind the scenes that's like you're probably going to make a, the same mistakes as them you're just not going to see that they also made those mistakes so Definitely smart that I'm doing this now, but there was a little bit where I wasn't doing this. And, oh boy, did some of those turn out bad. And honestly, I think there might be a VOD of me making that mistake and realizing. You know, I've got a ton of wood scraps out in my garage right now. Why don't I just try them out on that first? That's one of the things I really like about... Um, that loading ready run stream tap tap or not tap tap concede um tinker taylor solder fry is that uh ian freely admits it's a let's try program he doesn't come into it knowing exactly how things are going to turn out and that's great knowing that there's a chance for failure is kind of fun being able to say hey we're not experts at this we're having a good time with it. Learn as you do. Just give me a quick spin around to see how the colors are looking. Whether or not I'll need to do another pass on this green. I think it's working pretty well. If anything, I might give it a quick filtering glaze later. Just to even it out, but that's a decision for later. I think one of the biggest things that I had to learn about mini painting, 
particular was not to fix your mistakes right away. If you can, obviously, if you know you know, like went over a line or something, and you know you have the quick chance to grab a Q-tip and pull off a mistake, do that. But if you realize after it's dried, you know, after five, ten seconds, oh, I wasn't supposed to put paint there. Just move on. Move on and fix it later, because if you stop to try and fix every mistake in the moment, you're never going to get done. And what you find is that in the process, maybe that mistake doesn't actually need to be fixed. Maybe it gets covered by another step in your process anyways, or maybe it just kind of adds to it, or maybe you can't actually really see that it's a mistake. And in that, doing that, you can save yourself a lot of time by just not fretting over the little details too much. I think that's part of why Bob Ross said there are uh, no mistakes, only happy little accidents, because he knew that you should roll with what happens. If you do continue to notice that mistake afterwards, just turn into a happy little bird. Just about done with this section. Just going to bring up the saturation a little bit on these sections because we are using medium to extend our paint a bit makes it a little transparent which will naturally desaturate it a bit when you we only put down uh, one layer just going back over real quick with the second layer as soon as the last one dried that saturation and opacity up just a little bit. All right. And I think we are good on that. 
And with that, I think we can uh, go ahead and roll that right into our first break of the night. So everybody go ahead, get up, stretch your legs, refill your drink. Be back in about four or five minutes time. All right, and we are back. Everybody had a good uh, break. So now we are going to work our outside in. Flop around my wet palette real quick. Grab a new test piece. We're going to start desaturating some nice yellow. Got ourselves some Alejo Deep Yellow. Got our gray. And our white. Let's see if we can't make a nice yellow that still isn't too bright.
one of the main difficulties I find with working with yellow is it really wants to be a bright color. And particularly you'll hear people in uh, the painting hobbies, the mini painting hobbies, complain about how yellow does not like to exist over dark colors. Um, so like if you prime a miniature black, you are going to be working really hard to bring that yellow up over it without making it too much of a dull mess. So like there, already we're starting at a, quite a disadvantage. So what we're doing first is we're going to create that dull mess and see if we can't blend that in with some more yellow and work that down slowly and gently. And part of the issue has to do with the composition of yellows. We used to have really great whites and yellows to work with back in the old days of painting. But we're not allowed to use those anymore because those great whites and yellows use something called cadmium and lead. And uh, if you don't know your chemistry well, cadmium and lead are poison. They, um, yeah, you, uh, you developed what was called, I want to say, painter's madness or painter's craze, something along those lines. And, uh, that was heavy metal poisoning driving uh, all of your great painters nuts. It's not a good time to be an artist back then. I mean, it's never really a good time to be an artist. But it was worse back then. You can still get cadmium paints from specialty stores. It's just uh, definitely one of those things where it's like, I know I can get this really great yellow, but do I really want to give myself heavy metal poisoning to get this bright yellow that I want? Probably not. There we go. Now after all that work, a little bit of thinning. I think we've got pretty decent desaturated yellow. Doesn't look too dull. Yeah, the hatters used mercury as a part of their felting process for their hats. So they also got to deal with that in their own fun way. There we go. Yeah, I like that. That is a good yellow. Yeah, there were um there were a lot of problematic pigments back in the day. One of the favorite ones I've heard about recently actually um can't remember the name of it, but basically there was a very popular green pigment for the span of like 30 or 40 years during the 1800s um, that got used in everything from plateware to dresses to even wallpaper. And it turned out that um, it was full of arsenic and it was just so saturated in it, it would actually even leak out into the air. And, you know, kill people that lived in houses with that wallpaper. Yeah, that was a... Uh, oof. That 
Thank God we have the FDA these days. Elk's art channel. Come for the art. Stay for the talk about poisons through history. Or the failures of capitalism. Really, the history of pigments is quite one of those rabbit holes you can fall down. In particular, when you look at what was common throughout the centuries versus what was rare, and then moving into the more scientific, industrialized era, how we were able to surpass uh, our ancestors in that regard. So, you know, the uh, the prime example, of course, is purple as a sign of royalty. The, uh, the idea being that, you know, despite the fact that you can very easily get a blue dye or a red dye from natural sources like berries, uh, you can't really get a purple dye. You mix the two colors, red and blue, you know, you, you shift towards that uh, purple hue, but it becomes muddier because pigmentations are a subtractive pro light process. And the more you add them together, the darker they get overall until they eventually become brown or black. So you couldn't get a good, vibrant purple back in the day with most natural sources except for oysters. Hmm very specific type of clam or oyster, I believe, uh, back in the day of the Romans was found to, once you had uh, undergiven it a certain uh, chemical treatment, a tiny amount of a very vibrant royal purple. So in order to dye a single tunic's worth of um, fabric, this bright purple, you had to kill and harvest tens of thousands of clams. So it, if you wanted to look rich, you had to be rich. There was no way to fake the purple. Now then you compare that to today where you can buy a purple shirt off the rack because Thanks to chemistry, we were able to find, make synthetic dyes, particular, uh, oh, what's the pronunciation of it? I've got to write here in my uh, 
Liquitex paint kit, dioxazine purple. It's natural organic chemical. Honestly, a lot of the chemicals uh, very much share similar uh, aromatic structures, benzene structures of each other, and just little changes we're able to do in the lab to their structure to create new uh, chemical compositions, change how they interact with light. So, you know, if you ever develop a time machine, obviously pack a bunch of purple clothing. I don't know, I was going to go somewhere with that thought process, but uh, kind of went off the rails. I suppose the point is, color developed a lot of meaning in our early days because of its availability. You know, purple is royalty. Uh, pink was originally a man's color because it was the color of blood in water. Um, blue was considered dainty back in the old days because it was the color of uh, meadow flowers and was more associated with women. Stuff like that. So, the more you know about pigments, the more it can shape your view of history. And it's one of the reasons why art is actually very important. Um, an important thing to study, to understand humanity, because there's no pure science application without understanding humanity. You know, if you want engineers to build a structure, you're going to end up with something brutalist and awful, and, you know, you're going to end up with the 70s, honestly. And it's not going to understand the true needs of a human because it's not understanding our own psychology. So definitely, I'm definitely a fan of making more engineers take art history classes. Give you a yellow card for that one there, Keld. Got my eyes on you. <laughs> That's why you're only getting a yellow card. I'm no hypocrite. I'm just going to glaze over some of these crowns that didn't quite saturate that well. We're just going to mix in some glaze medium into our relatively thinned already paint. That'll make a nice filter we can apply to just bring it up just a little bit.
So BTS, the guys that are uh, playing right now, are taking a uh, bit of a hiatus from their international stardom in order to fulfill their mandatory uh, service obligations to the Korean government for the military. And it's always funny to me when you see the difference of interpretation between Americans and uh, Koreans for that fact, because the average American would be like, oh, that's such a shame. Those boys are going to be worked to the bone. And the Koreans are like, oh, they're getting a vacation. Because Korean uh, pop stars actually work harder on tour than uh, Korean military men. Uh, in terms of the physical expenditure of energy, how little sleep they get, uh, how often they're practicing, the number of shows that they're playing. There's many documented cases of uh, K-pop stars coming out of the military service looking healthier than the, when they went in because they actually got to take breaks and relax and eat good food and not constantly be exercising. <laughs> Just uh, one of those little funny things that's in the back of my head. I dated a, uh, a big K-pop stand for a while there. Alright, so now that we're done with that, mixing in... A lot of white into this yellow that we've got to get our creamy sky color. Because we want it to be bright, but we also want it to have a nice little yellow tone to it. Got our color here. I'm just going to brush some of it off real quick. Don't want to saturate the wood too much. Start blocking it in. Best not to work it over any of the places we've already painted. Doesn't matter too much on the clouds because those are going to get a flat titanium white. And while titanium white definitely isn't lead white, it does have decent coverage. So I don't have to worry about any of the yellow showing through.
once in a while we're having a little bit of a lull here. What do y'all think? How do you think it's coming together so far? I think the uh, move to reduce the color scheme a bit was a good one. I think, uh, I think the blues being all fairly close together definitely helped reduce the uh, dissonance, I'd want to say. The original one definitely had too many contrasting colors. I think just bringing it closer together without losing too much of its identity was a good call. Ironically, I think it, this sky color I mixed up is pretty close to the color of the wood itself. I like it. It's kind of got an eggshell color to it.
All right, and then we're just going to go for some of our straight white. Just a little bit of this creamy yellow mixed in to make an off-white. We'll use that for the clouds. Where did I put? There it is. My thinning medium. Let's see how that looks. Pretty milky. I think that'll work. So this uh, this musical artist Jessie, she's um, she's a Native American that moved back to Korea, and she definitely brought a bit of America with her. She's very what's the best word to say irreverent of some aspects of like Korean society social rules in particular she is not afraid to put herself out there in a way that others would find uncouth 
in particular, I, uh, oh, hey, Amanda. In particular, she, um, she's obviously had work done, um, plastic surgery. And, you know, while most Koreans are very, like, hush-hush about it, you know, everybody gets it, but nobody talks about it. One, uh, one time she was on a talk show, and she, uh, brought up the fact that, you know, well, somebody brought up the fact that she wears, wears very revealing outfits, and she responded with, Look, I paid a lot of good money for these tits. You know, if I paid good money for them, I'm going to show them off. And that just left, like, all of the, uh, like, of course, all of the uh, interviewers were male, and they were just like, Oh no, what do we say to that? <laughs> just completely shocked them. It's like, nope. What? Ah, uh, ah. Somebody cut to commercial, please, God. Just because, you know, nobody expects anyone to be that forward about it, and she's like, I don't care. This is who I am. So I've definitely always appreciated uh, her as an artist for that. How are you doing, Amanda? It's been a while since I've uh, had a chance to talk with you. Hopefully things are going well down there. Just having some fun here, blocking in the background of this Kingdom Hearts line out I burnt up. Nice. Tell Phil he still has to get me that resume. I want to make sure we can get him into my system so that uh, he has options later. Yeah, streams are pretty much like this. I chat about whatever's going through my mind and I paint. <laughs> yeah. The joy of being a perfectionist. I know that all too well. One of the biggest things I had to learn about with my art was being able to say good enough. Or at least being able to say, maybe this isn't good enough, but I need to stop with this piece so I can try again later with something new. Oh yeah. I feel that in every craft I do. That's always the problem of being the one creating it. You always know exactly what you messed up. Even if it's the littlest thing, you know how you could have done it better. 
Definitely feel sorry for everybody on my discords and all that who have to hear me complaining about, you know, oh, I did this so poorly. Uh, it's all a part of the process. Maybe one day I'll be happy with what I make. If I'm lucky. <laughs> I've been getting better about at least taking compliments. Being able to say, I appreciate the fact that you, you like this. Instead of responding with, well, but it's actually bad. Because I don't want to be dismissive of other people's feelings about my art. Because I do appreciate whenever anybody tells me they like it. Yeah, it's uh it's a game of inches. How about you, Amanda? Any uh any art you've been doing lately? Still doing that cosplay stuff? I haven't been on Instagram a lot lately, but I do remember you were doing a lot of uh like cosplay reels for a while there. Those always look pretty cool. Innsburg softball. I don't remember making a corp line reference. Yeah, you did uh, seem to have a really fun summer there. But hopefully you can get back to it. It's always a pain when you have to take a break from something you love.
Oh, yikes. Doubled in price, Jesus. Wonder if that's uh, related to the uh, supply chain issues or if it's just straight demand. Ridiculous, nonetheless. So I've been having the same issues with a few of my hobbies. Thanks to the war in Ukraine and just in general issues with wood, the Baltic birch I like to do my uh, laser cutting on. It's near impossible to find anymore. Ah, yeah, that'll do it. That'll do it. Alright. I think we're good there. So we've uh, gotten up to the 135 mark, so we're going to take ourselves another quick little break while I figure out what color I want to do next. So in the meantime, everybody get up, stretch your legs, refill your water or other beverage, and we'll be back here in a few minutes.
All right, and we are back. Nice quick break. Get everything loosened up. I think what we're going to go for next is Sora's boots and his keyblade, which we're going to do in a straight sun yellow. Decided I want to take a break from desaturated areas because color mixing is a pain. Towards the end of the stream, I do not want to do that anymore. So, let's go for two drops of sun yellow. And, let's see. A bit of glazing medium. Just to thin the color out a bit. Oh, hey, Willow. Thanks for stopping on by. Then a little bit of water to help bring it together. Let's see how that goes. Could use a little bit of thinning. I like that color. That should do pretty well for his boots and for the hilt. What we're going to do is just grab a little bit of my favorite flow improver here. Says so it just got a little bit of surfactant action in it. Help break up the thickness of the medium a little. Give it even more self-leveling properties. So I've actually got a, uh, a YouTube channel that I put the VODs on. I can always share that with you. I've got it set up so that um, it strips out the music so I don't get the nasty DMCAs there. So aside from the fact that it's completely silent except for my talking, you should be able to do that. Yeah, we'll just start blocking this here in. It also doesn't have... I was about to say it doesn't have Twitch chat, but then I remembered I put that on my overlay. <laughs> so, scratch that. But yeah... I like the sun yellow. It produces just that nice, crisp yellow with the, like the little hint of orange there that gives it body. It's perfect for his boots here. Short forms, no, I've uh, never had the patience to do any real editing. Mostly just do this to hang out with my friends and have a reason to actually, you know, follow up on projects instead of letting them sit on my shelf half finished. I mean, maybe if I get a following for some reason, I'll start doing that, but until then, yeah. Yeah, no problem. Yeah, I'm just happy that y'all are here to hang out with me while I get some work done.
tell you the real awful part. The alt, real awful one is when I have to tell people no, I don't actually take commissions. Because I'm not huge on capitalizing on my hobbies. Also, I don't know how much I would even charge for something like this. Hey, Julie. Hope you're doing well. Yeah, I mean, if you want to. I have to find a way to compensate you for your time somehow. I'm sure we could work something out. Yeah. A way easier way to kill a hobby than to make it a job, at least in my opinion. Glad for anybody who can keep finding fun in their hobby after they've monetized it, I just can't. Because the expectation of getting something done, oof. I think that's at least in part my ADHD brain there. That's way too much stress to the process. Well, hi, Strubit. Hope I pronounced that properly. Thanks for uh, bringing your friends on over. My name's Yelk. And I'm just uh, sitting here with friends, painting them this Kingdom Hearts thing that I laser cut on one of my machines. We're just chilling, listening to some K pop. <laughs> Can I call them a tart at least, Julie? I definitely don't know how full-time streamers do it. The uh, the idea of playing video games for money, just like, great. I would never be able to play video games again. <laughs> You've managed to turn a fun, relaxing task into a stressful one for me. <laughs> Hey there, Strub. Thanks again for the raid. What were y'all up to?
That's a good way to approach it there, Amanda. I definitely, uh, definitely prefer alternative payments for things. Like doing commission swaps, you know. I'll make this thing for you if you make that thing for me sort of deal. This band is definitely one of those crazier K-pop groups. They're called Seventeen because originally they were going to have 17 members, but uh, for various reasons, three of them didn't uh, didn't pull through. But they still ended up with 14 members. And they go hard. I watched a uh, documentary movie about them, and oh boy, they went through some, some stuff. And they're one of the uh, one of the few self-produced K-pop groups, which means they do all of their entire writing. They do their own management. You know, they decide their own schedule, sort of deal. So, not only do they work hard, but they're the ones doing it to themselves. It's not the company doing it to them. So, definitely. Uh, Definitely a good set of boys. That looks pretty good. Just double checking if I missed anything here. Really easy. Oh, there we go. Right there. Really easy to forget about one or two spots of color. And up next, let's see, I think we're going to grab this gray again, give it the same dilution treatment, and hit the key plate with it. So about an equal amount of glaze medium to extend the color. That's one of the one things I really like about mini painting. Is that, you know, these tiny 17 milliliter bottles, you know, they're expensive in a sense. Like this one bottle is about $4.50 altogether. And you think, oh, that's a lot of money for just this little bit of paint. But then you realize, you know, you're cutting it in half with uh, medium and then cutting it in half again with water or some other thinner. So you're really getting four times as much paint for the price. And you're usually not painting that much. So actually a lot of my, um, a lot of my paint goes to waste on this palette here. But I'm only really working in terms of drops.
Thanks, Amanda. Definitely has been a long process getting here. One of these days I'm going to try and branch this out to a bit of digital art too so I can work on um, doing up illustrations for my laser cutter. But for now I'm pretty happy doing what is effectively uh, paint by numbers. Very happy that my work has afforded me the ability to get all these cute little tools like my laser cutter and my CNC and stuff like that so that I can have something to look forward to after a long day. But what I think I'm going to end up doing with the key blade laid here is um, a little bit of a process called non-metallic metallic and what that is is instead of using metallic paints which usually have like a mica powder or something in it to give it an innate uh, sparkle or shine you use methods of glazing and layering uh, in sections and along stripes in order to give it the appearance that light is reflecting off of a raised edge on it, giving it the metallic look. And it's one of those techniques that I really need to practice more for like um, for like my Warhammer minis, because once you are able to do that sort of thing, your models just look so much better. But it does take uh, a fair bit of effort. Definitely have noticed that over time my bl brush control has been getting better. Just that innate muscle memory over time. Your fingers know exactly how they're supposed to move in order to get the effect that you want to do. That's one of the reasons why professionals and teachers will tell you, just keep doing it. Just keep trying and doing and do it over again and eventually you know, it's one of those things you just can't really teach now there's pointers you can give to get yourself started but for the most part you just got to keep working at it and get your brain to realize what it needs to be doing i can't tell you exactly what I'm doing with my fingers to get them to apply the paint in the way that I want them to. You know, there are some concepts like um, stroke length and pressure and stuff like that, but at the end of the day, it's very much it's just something that you pick up. And I think that's one of the things that actually makes art so beautiful is it's not mechanical. It's not something we can just tell a machine how to do. Because if I could just, you know, tell my laser, hey, make it look like this, well, I think that'd take a little bit of the beauty out of it.
What do you mean by uh, highlighter there, Wulu? Oh. Did I just completely miss a whole bunch of conversation? I probably did, didn't I? <laughs> Yeah, makeup is definitely one of those things where I, uh, I really should do more looking into. Because a lot of the concepts that uh, are implemented with art, especially with brushing and airbrushing and stuff like that, translate really well to makeup. Contouring, shadows, mid-tones, highlights, foundationals, all that good stuff. Oh yeah, mica powder as a way to, you know, gl do glitter effects, right, right. <laughs> oh yes, glitter is, uh... There's accidents and then there's glitter accidents. I've definitely walked away a little too shiny some days myself. Just gonna start blocking in some of these zippers and stuff like that will go a little bit over time for our schedule but that will be fine just gotta swap to a finer point brush real quick because like i said don't want to waste too much of this paint and it was only a drop but look at all this that we've got on the palette still So we're just going to dab a little bit in on each one and try not to go too overboard. Let's see what else do we have. Belt buckles would be a Square Enix game if it their characters weren't covered in belts and buckles. Yeah, the um, the wood honestly does a really good job of soaking up the paint. 
And it also helps that, like I said, we're using miniature hobby paint here, the Vallejos. And uh, the comparison is that uh, mini paints are very much more in the realm of like heavy body inks uh, compared to the uh, heavy body artist paints. There's a lot more pigment and a lot more solvent uh, compared to medium. So it um, it definitely means that a little bit goes a lot further. I have no idea what these are on his hands here, but they also seem to be like sort of a metallic gray in the reference image, so we're just going to give them that. We'll touch it up later to bring some highlights in on it. And it's definitely not a cheap hobby to get into. I think, uh, so to show off real quick, this is my Liquitex soft body acrylic uh, set. And it's, uh, it's pretty close in texture, uh, various ratios to hobby paints. Uh, very soft, very highly pigmented, uh, very uh solvent heavy as well so it'll it'll apply in the same way that uh this stuff will but this is not cheap um these bottles this set all together i want to say cost me 60 dollars for the uh what is it 12 of these so that's about five six dollars yeah five dollars a bottle for 22 milliliters, still not that bad. Honestly, approximately the same. And this is probably what you would want to start off uh, with because uh, while it won't provide you with the range of colors that I have, uh, I've got probably a hundred of these little hobby paints. Uh, the benefit to these is that these are high quality artist paints and you'll see on the, the labels you've got uh, Dioxazine purple, uh, ultramarine blue red shade, cerulean blue, yellow oxide, uh, medium azo. What this is basically telling you, and is something you can also check here on the side of the label, these are single pigment paints. You know, those PR9, P, PV19, PY74 which means that, like I've said previously, um, when you're mixing a lot of pigments, you are working towards the convergence point of pigment, which is black. You know, black it, uh, paint pigments are a subtractive process. The more you add together, the closer to black you get. Compared to light, which is an additive process, the more light you add, the closer to white you get. So the point being is that even though that set of 12 paints is $60, technically that's all the paint you need because when you're mixing only two pigments together, you're not running the risk of mudding it to black immediately. You can use that to create basically any hue on the color wheel without sacrificing too much light. So with those you know, 12 bottles of paint, uh, because it also includes white, black, and browns for your uh, tinting and shading, you can effectively create any color you want as long as you're willing to mix them. We have a long walk to get to that point, but color theory is always important. But I would definitely recommend if you ever want to get into um, this sort of painting to start with a Liquitex set like that because there's a lot of potential in them.
And if you're more into like on canvas paint, they also make the same exact set except in a heavy body acrylic, which uh, takes the canvas much better than a soft body will. It just has a uh, thicker, more gel-like consistency, so it sits on the canvas bare without streaking or falling down. You maintain a lot more of the texture, especially if you want to be maintaining your brush strokes for whatever reason. Let's see, am I missing any other bits of exposed metal? I think I pretty much got it. A little bit on his necklace I think I need to grab. And then he's got a little bit of chain here. I think pretty much got everything that I need to gray up here. So I think we can close out the stream in just a minute. So thanks again, everybody, for stopping by. It's always glad to see, I'm always glad to see y'all. Always happy to have some friends around while I paint. And we are going to toss you at somebody else once I figure out who we want to toss you at. Uh, looks like Cam is playing some Civ 6 right now, so we're going to go ahead and raid him. Uh, Cam is one of the Lair folks. Uh, he's uh, an interesting comedian. Uh, he's got a bit of a, more of a dry side uh, to his humor. Uh, and he does go pretty heavy into some existential philosophy at times, but uh, I really like that about him. So feel free to join the raid if you want. If not, I hope you have a good rest of your evening or morning or whatever it is, wherever you're at. And, uh, you know, do something good for yourself. Treat yourself well. Practice self-care. And we'll see you all later. Thanks for stopping by.